Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's session. Today, we'll be doing things a little differently. We'll be showing something practical. Uh, so over the last few weekends, uh, we were doing the LLM hackathons challenge. And basically, we decided not to do the usual hackathon thing. We decided to do our own like game world environment and try to use LLMs to solve this game world. So this game world involves some collaboration. It's like an escape room style game world. And we intend to see how far we can push large language models to do this kind of collaborative problems. I mean, you already know like Voyager goes in the Minecraft. They could prompt one single agent to solve like a video game, like the Minecraft environment. So we are thinking how can we do things better to do like some form of conversation between multiple collaborative agents, something like the generative AI paper. Uh, so together with me and my team, we have uh, Richard and a few others. But um, today, Richard will be sharing more about his adventures into trying to do conversation between LLM agents. So without yeah. further ado, I'll hand over the time to Richard. Thank you. Um, sure. So as the see the conversation is problem solving. This is the, the sort of idea I've been working around specifically um, after this idea of the dinner de con, which is the dinner of fools. The idea being we're not making, this is not a committee of experts. There's only one AI at work. Here. There's only one large language model. There's nothing ter terribly clever about any of these. We're just going to offer them the opportunity to talk about this. So the basic premise is large language models are good at words. They have evidence of rationality and understanding with regards to words. Large language models are not good at other things necessarily. There's some caveats around that, but I'm not going to get into it. So the idea is to reduce problem to words and introduce discussion to tease out relevant facts. This is the basic sort of approach that I've I've taken for this. So what I'm, I'm going to, I will dive into code in a minute, but I'm going to hold off for that for a minute. Because I want to emphasize the approach here is there are as few numbers as I can get into this solution. Bearing in mind, it's on a grid basis, like um, X, Y coordinates and so on. So there are some numbers, but they're not actually terribly relevant to the problem or the solution. The structure I've used is there's three kinds of thing at work here. The procedural components, classic Python code for the game board, simulator, and rules. There's language components, coach and player. In the moment, I've only got one player and one coach working. There's no particular limit on that, but that's what I've got at the moment. And then interface components. In my case, I've used GPT 3.5 function definitions. Um, and I'll go into a little bit of the pros and cons because uh, John and I have some, had some significant back and forth on this topic. Um, but I'll, uh, in my case, I'll show you there's a specific reason why I've done it this way. Um, the escape, pro this, this is my escape room. You can see it's extremely simple. The player, in our case, Bob, needs to stand on a tile the same color as the door. There is one door with one color and one tile. And Bob has to get this right turns out to be quite hard for Bob. So um, I'll quickly, I'm going to, so th this seems trivial, but it's not 100%. What works? So at the moment, conversations can flow quite naturally. I demonstrate that because it actually works, I think, quite well around a particular topic. Without, However, without a change in the environment, topics become recursive. They just go around in circles because they just keep talking about the same thing over and over again. So it's a bit dull, and but they are proposing actual solutions to an actual problem. And even in the current in development state, I'm, I'm beating random. So most of the time it'll solve the problem correctly. And it's a matter of trying to get it to do a, a better job. And a part of that is me providing feedback on rules back into the system again. So I think if we go back a second, if you look at the structure, the the I need to do work to make this work on all three types of component, right? Because the rules aren't enforced correctly. The language components need better, there needs to be more players and they need better prompts to do sensible things. And then the interface components, um, actually they're probably the bit that works best. I might need additional bits though. So to, I'll quickly try and demonstrate now. So, um, I'll quickly show what happens in sort of the chat room demo that I've got. I'm not going to, I'll come back to the code in a minute if anyone's particularly interested. 
Let's see this if I can remember how. Hello. Um, let's quickly run this. So this is three characters talking about a problem where I've told, given them an idea about what they're in an escape room. Talk about the escape room. All right, the same scenarios we had there, but I've just typed in this is what the room looks like. So let them run for a little while and I'll, I'll stop it because they'll go around in circles. Uh, Richard, sorry to interrupt you here. Uh, is it sure. possible to zoom in your terminal a bit so that um, it's easier to see? I don't know. That's a very good question. Um, one second. I'll, I'll pull this out. Yeah, it's copy just... paste it in, no in a notebook box as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So, um, all right. So, We've got the, these characters, Smith, Jones, and Penny. Um, I can't quite remember why. Um, and one of them is told to introduce themselves and the problem. Um, I, I think that's the coach. And they just and the coach has a special role. They can't play. They can only talk to other players. Right? Um, I think, John, you had a similar idea. And I think it's a recurring theme in all kinds of places. So it introduces the problem. Let's have a discussion. What do you want to plan? Any thoughts on how you should approach to us? Nice introduction. Great. We like it. Uh, Penny, sorry, Jones comes back and says, well, let's take a closer look at the mysterious blue tile on the floor. Great idea. Okay. It might hold a clue to opening the door. We know, but they don't know. It's actually, it's the trigger that will open the door. And I'll go check out the blue tile. Great. Maybe there's something hidden underneath. We can't do that, but whatever. So they've come up with some, now they're going back to talking about what we'd like to do one day, right? And they'll go back around in that loop more or less forever. And I looked at this and went, that's great. Now, I'll try to see if we can get the code up a bit bigger. Because um, that's going to be a bit annoying for everyone. Um, what I'll do is I'll take these character definitions, which may look a lot like prompt to, to everyone. So these are the characters who were just having our conversation. So Smith is the coach, can't play yourself, and so on. And you can see here, you know, explicitly, there's no coordinates, there's no um, maths, there's no nothing. That is not an accident. It's very much part of the, the goal here. Um, and here you can see what the room looks like. This is the d definition I gave them. You can see a blue door floor is mostly covered in white tile except for one blue tile in this case i've said you cannot see the whole room so what i'd like to do is have them the players actually start off in different parts of a large map that they can only see locally then they have to change exchange information to find each other and whatever that'd be nice i'm not nearly there but that's that's the idea i'm trying to get across here is um the only communication should through be through this little chat room idea making that work is proving to be a bit of a, a trick I'll come back to that in a second. Um, in terms of the, oh, is there any interesting bits of code? Not really. There's just some prompting, and that's about it. Um, all of this code, by the way, if people who wish to look at it, is on um, GitHub. Um, so you, feel free to peruse at your leisure. In terms of, I'll quickly do a quick rundown of the grid world. No, it's not even that. Actually, I'll just run that quickly to show you what the output looks like, what goes to the behind the scenes in the... So I like this, that it can work with uh, without regard for the game environment. I mean, you just need to plug and play the description and then the conversation will still occur regardless of how you do it. That right. is explicitly the goal here, yep. It is really very much all about um, the rules are the rules. They're not. They're not the technique. Right. The the game being played is irrespective. One of the challenges here has been to get them to play by the rules, right? Um, and get them to understand the rules. So here you can see quickly a sort of try and zoom in a bit further. You can see we present in three rows of JSON data, right? So this is clearly the data representation. And GPT 3.5 does a very good job of understanding what this means. And I've laid it out carefully. 
there's been a few attempts to get this right. One of the real lessons learned here was I had to put the coordinates on each tile. Otherwise, it's very difficult to ground the model in terms of which which way is up. Right? So the direction system I copied from you, John, is cardinal, northeast, southwest, and, and so on. Um, and the but what which way is north in terms of the coordinates? I struggled with for a while before I realized I had to ground it somewhere. And here's where I grounded it. And so that's where the numbers come from in the output we'll see in a minute. Um, in the solver, this is a bit of a mess at the moment. Let's see what I need to do. I've got the wrong thing. because I've introduced a second player to see what happens. What mostly happens is it breaks. I'll do a quick walk through of the main loop of the this. I'll pull this out. Oops. I can't help but notice there's a winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's two failure conditions or success conditions, right? There's a six, explicit success and explicit failure. So um, this is not the best code and looking in, in Notepad is not very easy. I'll, I, I won't spend a lot of time on this. So while we not well, there's no success and no failure. Continue, right? Then for each player, so they go in turns in a round robin style. Get the view for a player, which is a thing that tries to describe that JSON structure we're just looking at. And a description I'll show you in a minute. It varies in its quality. It really struggles with differentiating between a blue door on a white tile and a blue tile because they the object on the tile in the JSON structure is a separate object with its own properties. And I've, I've had a bit of trouble getting that to really. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Stick. On this point, I also realized you know when I did context dependent prompting, like um mm -hmm. when I fit, fed in context of the room and like I described, for example, like blue square at this position. Um and blue key at this. So I gave an example using like blue square blue key, and then like my environment also contains blue square blue key. Sometimes mm. um GPT might mistake my example for the real thing. Yep. So, so yep. similarly, like for <laughs> blue square or blue keys, I mean they might mix them up together because of the word blue. So yep. um, it is one issue with large language models right now is that because of the way they do associations, they may hallucinate certain relations. Like yeah, for, and, for um, the, and I've yeah. Yeah, all of all of that. I've these ones at the moment. I haven't turned down their temperature, so I think for this, it's probably a good idea to turn the temperature to zero. Um, I'm not sure, but I think that's probably a good idea because this these ones keep making up stuff, like a lot of stuff. Maybe if we go and pull on the door, it'll open. There is no pull on the door. I've told you you can't pull on the door. And it, they keep wanting to go pull on the door because that's what doors do, right? That's the association for actions with doors. And, but it's not that kind of door. So, um, and I suppose, and I think it's another thing to, while we talk about sort of things we've learned is the, that JSON data structure is every bit as much part of the model as the prompting is. That JSON structure is absolutely part of your prompt. So, the names, the order of the operations are really carefully can have been carefully considered. So I tried random, what however they, they turned up. And I had weird behaviors. So I had to insert things like class name and I had to keep the, the order of them consistent to give it a better chance of finding relationships. Um you know, in JSON, the order that things appear in an object are not important. They're utterly irrelevant in JSON definition. However, in GPT, it's just words and it really, and context counts, right? So. Yeah, actually that's also what I use in my strict JSON. I did like a very general to specific prompting by ordering the JSON accordingly. Like you can say broad goal, then I say generate broad goal. Then it's a specific goal to generate. So because of the way you order it, the subsequent generation will be based on the earlier rows of the JSON. Uh, which doesn't mix, uh, it doesn't work like that in actual JSON, but for GPT prompted JSON, absolutely. It totally does, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also another thing I realized, the title or the name of your JSON label, like for example, um, coordinates. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, if you say coordinate, they understand it well. But if you just say something like map, or I mean, something that is not very like X Y coordinate based numbers, like yeah. a, a, <laughs> like, a random, yeah. maybe a made up word called site. You know, if you say yeah. something like that, although the data is exactly the same, but because you give a different word that is not present in like the training set, perhaps yeah. for like this kind of two D grid problems, mm -hmm. it's not able to associate that well. So yeah. naming matters a lot. I I got a I'm gonna say here that it's a real advantage i i'm i'm monolingual i am incompetent at every other language much to my wife's irritation um but i'm very good at english and it's very helpful if you you really do sweat the particular word you're going to use have a thesaurus nearby right <laughs> it's it's like it's a really it there's something to be like we have um the name of it not auto gpt um for training um deep learning systems auto trainer sort of arrangements right there's something to be said for having one for these prompts which go which actually just runs through and tries different words to find out what the better answer is or what the better prompt is for a given outcome um makes a huge difference um the so anyway in this this main loop goes and finds get the view for player because every player might have a different view um, and it does ask for a view with respect to the named player and they all have their own name um debugging blah 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 send it to the chat room so it says this player saw that right? puts it in the chat room i haven't got back to getting things back out of the chat room so far as the rest of this code goes so at the moment it's just a log of what's happened um and then the proposed act and action for the player. So this is the text component, the prose component of rash of the rationalizing. Right, the player, the, the agent for the player is given. You can see this. What are you going to do to achieve this goal? And it's that's all it's told. It's not told how to respond or anything like that. It just comes up with my opinion is this, and I call that an intent. And he goes and says, I want to do this, right? Now, this move is not accepted at this time, right? It's just an idea. What we're going to do is for this idea, you know, up to the number of max tries and so on, right? We're going to ask the coach, critique this action. Consider the intent of the player, state of the board, and the rules. And you come back and you have to say, two things number one there's a boolean which is in, enforced is it okay and two why is it okay so um and the coach goes off and does these things and we get to this thing so this this line here is exactly why i've used gpt 3.5 functions because it every time gives me a perfect boolean for that value it never goes. Can you check JSON and do the same as well? <laughs> oh, it never gives me the string t uh, true. <laughs> it, it always gives me the boolean, right? But that's but that is when I say strict. I mean strict enough that I can. That's that line's never fail. Everything else is broke, but that bit works. Right? So, um, and then after that, we've got this accepted move and intent. We've got this next bit, which is translate intent into action. This is another one of those interface components. And it also is, it's a call to GPT, which at 3.5 and it says, you are attempting to call the move function, which has just player and direction. That's the only things that are there. So it says, given this intent, the state of the game, and then the game grid and the player, and that game grid in this case is actually the raw JSON. It's not the description, it's the data. Right? And so this one is being asked to come back with um, direction, essentially, right, for that player. Um, and it's, then it says move player, which is into the procedural part of the game. And that has, that includes the, the rule, each tile may only have one object that is a door or a player on it. And it will fail and has, certainly has failed. Um, that will fail there if you were trying to move a player into an occupied square. 
Um, you can see I have not figured out what to do about that yet. <laughs> so so um, the move can fail. We throw an exception and go there. If the function is not approved, if the if, sorry, if the if the coach doesn't like what's being proposed to it, says no, you can't go there. There's something in the way, right? It'll come back, and all we do is is debug and say, nope, and we go back through this loop again up to max tries. Right? What I haven't got here is to include feedback about why we're we doing this again. That's the problem at the moment, right? In terms of my development. And then down here, if you ran out of move uh, attempts, it just says, could not find an acceptable move to the coach, fail the game, we're done. And here's the victory conditions, right? If you manage to get, in this case, this is with two players and there's two blue squares. I happen, I've set this up. These are where the blue squares are and there's only two things that can move in this game. So if those game squares are filled, then you've succeeded, well done. Winner, winner, chicken dinner, right? We're off. So that's that's your, your game loop, right? It is technically possible to have, maybe it's possible anyway, but these, these are unrelated conditions. Game failure is not the same as game success. Right? You can you can have a, you know, a, what do you call it? A vacuous success right? where you've somehow got the right answer, even though the coach didn't like your last move or something. I'm not quite sure how yet, but maybe that maybe that's possible. We've left open that possibility here. Um, and then uh, let's say that. And then the sorry, make that go away. Uh, is there anything else in here that's particularly interesting? I don't think so. I'll actually I'll bring these up. These are the function interfaces I'm using for GPT. And so this is the This is and these basically this return critique is what the the coach agent is asked to prepare a function call for. But actually there is a function. If you call it, it throws an error and fails the whole program. Nothing ever calls that function. Right? It's simply a way to get GPT to coerce a response into a structure which has, you know, approved of type boolean and critique of string. Again, remember. All this text is part of the prompt, right? So everything here you needs to be written as if you are attempting to instruct a, a large language model because it's exactly what you're trying to do here. This move player yes, is the actual they, move. Uh, Go on. If we put this as the OpenAI functions API, yep. do they count whatever stuff you put in the function as your tokens or yes. are they free? They, There's they no freebies. Count. Yeah, so so it means that if you use OpenAI functions, um, you're gonna have to incur a lot of token costs. Uh, depend. Yeah, can do. You, you certainly can, right? In this case, I've been lazy because I've included both function definitions together, but I only ever call it with one of it at a time. So what I should be doing is just going. When I'm when the coach is there, it only sees this return critique interface, and then. When I'm trying to move the player, you only see the move player interface. In terms of, is it expensive? It's not free, that's for sure. Um, but I have written it with a view to keeping the the size down. Um, could it be yeah, smaller? No, no, no worries. I only say this because you yeah. can do something very, very similar with like maybe half the token length using straight JSON. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, no, I I think. That, that I think that is probably true, right? I, I for this I wanted to use it in this particular way, and as I say the the an earlier version of this didn't use these interfaces and did use an approach like strict JSON, which is I would like a thing that looks like this, please, and I found it was mostly correct, like it like it is mostly correct, right? But in this case. I really, I forget. I just didn't get a good enough result. You know, so at the moment when I work, when I run this, I get a better than random outcome. If I change it around the way this works, I have got certainly less good than random outcomes. Um, so that's the. No worries. Uh, I know. I like to point yeah. out something in your code that is very similar to my code. Is that 
when we talk about the actions, mm. we need to provide a description that is semantically meaningful. So you cannot just say Absolutely, north, yeah. south, east, west. You need to say north with an offset of what? <laughs> south with an offset of what? Because uh, GPT, what will do? What will GPT do is they will associate the offset with, uh, with the grid position. And if we just do north, south, east, west, unless you provide it with some example of like how particular actions result in new states, like the transition, new uh, state, action, new state. If you give it a few examples, perhaps you can infer what's north, south, east, west. Mm. Um, but the problem with that is that a lot of grid walls, um, they use like the first coordinate is like perhaps the row and the second coordinate is the column. So it's like the first coordinate is the row, second is the column, because that's the way like the array structure works in, in Python. Yep. Like the 2D yep. array, the first one is the row and second is column. So like once I coded my environment, I realized that it confused like east. It, it tried to move the second number instead of the first number. So stuff like this. Um, yeah, is, I, I struggled very much yeah. there too. And Correct. if yeah. there's a, well, I'll show you the, the, the way it's asked to describe the environment. You get view for player. I'll bring that up quickly. That's a nice small thing. Yeah, because I think this is important to highlight is that if we want to do as minimal prompting as possible to GPT, mm -hmm. it is best to use whatever statistical um, tokens he has seen before. So I guess if I change my coordinates instead of like first first number is for column, second is for row, mm -hmm. is to change it to row column, perhaps I could prompt it lesser. So so that's the difficulty. Like if you do out of context, or in this case, like out of the norm convention uh, kind of coordinate system, you need to spend a bit more effort to few short prompt. GBT. Yeah, it, it's absolutely exactly what it's, as you said, right? And here, I I tried a, a version of this without referring to coordinates at all in the um in the sort of linguistic part of this, right? There's three components, right? The language part of it, but I found that you know the move actually had like, the move function must use coordinates, right? Otherwise, it doesn't work. Like you, you can't just say uh, the the backing for the for this is a two D grid, right? And it doesn't have a concept of north, but the descriptions all talk about north, east, south, west. So who's to say what north is? So I had to put in this rule or this instruction so that there could be agreement between the rules of the game and the description of the game. Um, because before that, it was just a bit of a mess. Right? Um, I had I was trying to use coordinates in the language side, which I explicitly didn't want to do, and um, so on. So, and th this you know, as an approach, this works quite well. If anything, the three hundred tokens is pretty too big. Right, that can be cut down quite a lot, but it does give some nice, good descriptions. I haven't. I've only tried with this toy board of three by two. Um, well, I'm trying now with a larger one and two players to see what happens. But at the moment, it's making all kinds of mistakes. I only started doing that about an hour ago. Um, yeah, so that that's sort of what is sort of an interesting thing here is the way that I really have to spell out the rules. Right? The rules, most of this is the rules, right? This is actually rules, that component. The rest of it is just, Show me what's, tell me what's going on, please. Uh, but these are the rules. And that's not very good at following them. <laughs> there's a separate thing which describes the rules, but in terms of get, they, they need to change context for this function. So there's actually, a, for the other functions, there's a different prompt, right, which is shared. But this one, it, it changes to be descriptive. The other one, with the rules elsewhere, I'll quickly find them, are prescriptive. So, so this is the, the prescriptive version of the same rules that's included. We're talking about taking an action. Yeah. And it talks about the goal is this, the rules are that. Very nice. Actually, it's quite uh, refreshing and uh, reassuring that we both work on separate um, ways, but we converge in a very similar way. I also have something like rules. I call it word description. Sure. So it's like at least to tell semantically to GPT what is good and what is bad, 
I mean, what, what should be done and what should not. If not, you will hallucinate certain moves. Yes. So <laughs> I think that's a major issue that uh, we found. I mean, even in the paper for Reflexion, uh, R-E-F-L-E-X-I-O-N, uh, they did on this world called Elf World, where it's like a text-based RPG. Where you can pick objects, you can place objects, open keys, and, uh, open doors, and so on. They realized that the hallucination is the uh, one of the biggest causes of failure. And um, yeah. that highlights that the way the knowledge is represented in GPT is not exactly the same as like how we would think it does. Okay, it's not constructing a knowledge graph. It's just basically mm. associating like tokens. various tokens together. Mm. And I mean, because of the positional embeddings, it's only able to associate tokens that are perhaps closer to it. So I realized that in some cases in your JSON, if you don't repeat like maybe the goal, in your bottom half of the prompt, it may forget the goal because the goal is all the way at the top. So yep. stuff like that is also what um, Meta found out in like Lama 2, they have this thing called goals attention. It sounds very cool, but what they are doing is just repeat the prompt again for each output of the uh, AI. So like they give the context again at every um, AI output. So this is, I think, one of the key drawbacks of positional based embeddings is that you only can like refer to stuff that is pretty near you. If not, if it's too far away, you might lose the context. Um, perhaps there could be a way to, to like better do the contextual prompt once we get some form of like knowledge graph representation out. They can extract relevant parts of it and form a shorter prompt. Uh, I also realized in my experiments that if your prompt is short and concise and it contains everything you need without the redundant stuff is a much higher chance of success. Uh, for example, in this north, south, east, west environment, uh, I also had like pick up object, place objects and so on. So if let's say you are trying to navigate to the squares or leave out picking and placing objects, if you don't include the pick and place functions, you have a much higher success rate of navigation. But um, uh, the opposite is true. Like if you are trying to pick and place objects and like you don't need to use any other functions, if you put all the functions there, it's going to hallucinate the use of all these functions as well. Um, I also faced this issue in the app challenge. I gave it a lot of functions, like 10 over functions. And uh, I realized the performance, if you just give it like the three or four functions that it needs, right? If you give it only the three or four functions that it needs to fulfill its tasks, the performance is way better. So a way I, think, I, I think that was one of the things I was looking at for this is conversational approach was to use the separate agents to have separate functions available to them potentially. And so I think uh, that that was one of the things I just realized a bunch of things in chat. Um, yes. So um, the, the um, Yeah, and the um, chat just mentioned that GPT-4 can work well regardless of prompt length. Yep. Um, that is, I mean, it's, it definitely works better than chat GPT. Uh, but it also has the same issues of um, positional embeddings. I, I've used GPT-4 for Arc Challenge. It's a similar finding that I have. So um, the problem lies fundamentally with how transformers work. I, it's actually not much of a problem. It's more like this is just how it's designed. Like humans also, we tend to forget things earlier in the conversation unless you like repeat it again in your long-term memory uh, and, and, and so on. And I, yeah. I think that's one of the things I was looking to here was once I've developed the chat log is to figure out how to you know, have another, like the answer to this in my mind is always you have another agent, right? And one of the, one of the, one of the agent roles is summarize the discussion so far, right? What's been tried and what worked and what didn't work. Right. And I think that can, those, those are the kinds of, of things that are possible with these, with GPT 3.5, that feels reasonable. You know, it is, as a rule, quite good at summarizing text. So we're building up a chat log for it to summarize. Right? That's one of the sort of driving features of this. There's no, there's no numbers. Is, is yeah. so you can do things like that. Also, oh, I can do things like that. But that, that's the that's the idea at any rate. Yeah, actually, I also realized one thing. I will highlight this in my presentation later. Um, some cases, rule-based methods, like basically programming, works mm -hmm. way better than large language models. Like, yes. we want to find out whether an objective <laughs> is fulfilled, like whether an agent reaches a certain square. Um, there's some case that uh, ChatGPT fails to 
identify as success, uh, succeeded. And um, in these cases, if you could have a rule-based method to just compare positions, mm -hmm. that works way better than large language models. Uh, of course, I also realized that like if you use GPT-4, it's much better. Uh, but in this case, we try to do things with the lowest level GPT because of cost. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the situation of GPT-4 is much cheaper than, yes, you can use GPT-4. But if you want to use chat GPT, my experience is that you cannot prompt it to do too many things at one go. Nope. You should prompt it only like one step at a time if possible, nope. or like nope. at most two steps. Because the more you prompt, it sometimes like just gets, um, I mean, for one step, it's okay. For two steps, uh, works most of the time, all right. But if you give it three or four steps to do at the same time, it just gets confused. And and uh, yeah. I think one of the things I found was to really stress, you shouldn't use negation, like a triple negative. So don't, don't use negation in your definitions. It often loses the word not or don't or versions of that often get lost. Uh, there's not enough, enough emphasis on those words to make the logical change that you're looking for when you restructure the sentence. So I've had to, it's one of the things you'll notice here, and there, there is no, don't do this, don't do that. It always says, it's always emphatic. It is this, it is that, because it's, I've noticed it's much better at addressing. So mm -hmm. instead of saying this sentence, I spend a, too much time on, players must remain on the tiles, right? What I mean is, don't go to negative one as an index because that's out of bounds. Oh, but actually, I, I realized a way to improve your rules. Yeah. Um, you could give one example. Probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and and, but that's the the challenge I've got is that that trying to make them emphatic rather than implicit. If that, and and so that I'm not sure if that even makes sense technically, but you know actually, what I mean. I, I hope yeah. maybe the general rules can be very general, like um your initial ones. So you talk about oh, you must use evidence to solve problems. It can be very general at the beginning. But when it comes to a specific environment, perhaps there could be a separate agent that specifies the specifics for the environment for like these agents to work on. Because um, when we want like an uh, LM-based agent to do something, it is best to be as specific as possible to avoid hallucinations. But by being specific, we lose the generalizability of solving arbitrary environments. So maybe it has to be the case that you have to like specifies, uh, I mean, that's a new word I invented. Like you, you, have you have to, to have, specify. Yeah, you, are, you, have, you have to have a process to specify for a particular environment only within that environment. So like for different environments, you specify differently. So there needs to be a meta process that does that. But at the base level, the language model at the base level of this system, it should receive the most specific um, instruction Version. as possible. Yeah. yeah. I, think, uh, I think there might be something in that. But the... There, there's yeah i think this is it i don't have a huge amount more to show because i have stupidly moved my code on from the bit that actually works now it's broken again i need to go back to a checkpoint um to take me a minute um do you want to hang on, i'll close that that's not gonna help anyway I'll yeah maybe try. we have like one to two minutes uh, I, I think it's very great work because i intend to do this like coach thing uh with player <laughs> interaction definitely um as a next step for, for the one that I'm going to show. Uh, mine is just purely coach. Uh, there's no discussion between the players. There will be a central, <laughs> yeah. there'll, there'll be a boss directing the workers to do stuff. Yeah. I'm just curious, uh, have you tried without the coach? Does it work? Um, For the one player, I think it will. But when I'm, the role of the coach here is, I found in other things, the need to, um, you know, I've been filling around with strict JSON, right? Which, as the model. Yeah. And a retry with feedback, that React model, is really effective. Like, it really yeah. is. It works yeah. very, very well. And so that's where I'm trying to get this to. And the fact I haven't got the feedback back into the loop is is on me, right? That's something I want to do and I haven't done yet. Sorry, I also haven't done mine yet. <laughs> I'm trying to get it to work without feedback first because if you keep needing feedback to work, it's very lengthy. I want it to work one shot if, if possible. Uh, yeah. I admire your enthusiasm. <laughs> no, because as the environment gets more and more complex, you can't have everything being feedback. Like you should try to as far as possible to get the base model to work without feedback first. It, yeah, and then I, I, 
I do, but at the same time, as it gets more complex, I was talking about, I can't remember the guy's thing, about social relationships. And there's a, it's a deeming number and is a social theorist. And he says, you know, roughly you can have a family unit, people who you are simpatico with, you can finish each other's sentences, you implicitly know what they need, um, about four or five people. And then conversely, you people who you can keep in touch with, got some idea of what they're up to, you know their names and probably most of their family, about 100 people. And then it's got different layers and different sort of levels within that. And I think that's a... I suspect I haven't read Deming's work tremendously closely, but I suspect that's to do with the way our communication works as people. Mm. And I don't, because LLMs are based on that same premise, they also will have these natural limits. You know, in Amazon, they talk about two pizza teams. You get to six to eight people, you can't, you don't know what each other's working on. Then you get a management overhead. There's the same, these Deming numbers, there is some. It's not just one guy's theories. There's, there's experience to back it up too. And I think we'll find the same limits with these where you need hierarchies of of management as, the, as the, the, the managed become too big. And then it becomes its own overhead. And you end up with middle managers and executives. And, um, I, think, I think that's probably mine to... I'll see if I can get this back into its working checkpoint. But otherwise, John, if you want to carry on and we'll we'll go from there sure uh so for the rest um maybe a quick like five to ten seconds uh any questions you all have for richard oh, I think, sure. yeah i think he did a great job with this uh, you want to ask anything before i move on to like what i did for the 2d world okay no, thanks so much richard yeah cool. thank <laughs> if you anything, just ask in the chat also yeah that's fine Please, uh i'm going to take over screen sharing okay yours. so I'm going to show you like my my desktop, okay, perhaps. Yeah, so you can see that this is my desktop right now. And um, okay, so this is the, are you able to see this um, this game right now? I'm oh, sorry, I mean this uh, Jupyter Notebook. Or, or okay, can y'all see the Jupyter Notebook? Okay, I'm just going to run the code, okay? And we will just look at the simulation of, I'm going to show you two things. The first one is, Nope, we've lost your voice. Oh, I have. Is it me who's dropped out? Hello. Hey, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, I think I have to upgrade my laptop. Yeah, <laughs> apparently when I do Zoom and show this Pi game, it crashes sometimes. Uh, but can y'all hear me again? And can y'all see the screen? Can can y'all do? Can y'all hear that? Yeah, yeah, can do. 
Okay, let's try again. Again, if it doesn't work, I'm just going to run through the code the next time. All right, so let's run this whole code and hopefully it doesn't crash. Okay, it's looking good. Okay, uh, can you see the Pi game? No, at the moment. Okay, wait a while. Ah, there we go. Yep. Can you all see this? I can see it. Yeah. yeah, so if you look at this two-actor grid wall, um, you can see that the aim is to step on two squares that are not green or not red. So it means that you kind of need to go to blue cells. So you can see that um, over here, the agents are trying to get there. So they are moving like stuff like left, left, left. You can see, uh, but like... Sometimes it's not getting there. So you can see um, over here, what happens is that each agent is assigned a goal. Like the first agent is assigned the goal of 9,5, which means nine squares on the right and five at the top. And the second goal is 3,7. So over here, we can see the issue, all right? <laughs> the issue is that the goal setting for the agents here, it's not correct, okay? So perhaps this query can be too complicated sometimes. So no, no biggie, let us modify the query to make it easier. Let me just restart the kernel. Yeah, now I hope it doesn't crash. Okay. So I'm going to change the instruction here. So we can just change it to step on two blue squares. Okay, and what we will do is we will run ourselves again. Okay, thank goodness. Okay, so it looks like if I reset restart my kernel, it's fine. So I want to show you how this uh grid wall, the first version of the grid wall, which is just the agents moving to the cells, how this works. Okay. So the idea is that the central planner will take in the tasks, okay, and plan out the, the actions needed for both agents. So you can see this is the grid right now. And you can see if you just put like step on two blue squares, the central planner is able to like plan like, for example, agent one is to two comma eight, which is this blue square and agent two is six comma nine. And the large language model will base on the offset of its current position to the goal position and, and do some moves. But it's, you see, it's not exactly that perfect. Okay, That's why I feel like this kind of navigation problems, it might be better off if we were to do th them with like some rule-based method. Because as you can see, like it's going all over the place. Sometimes it reaches, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, This is uh, an example of how difficult it is for large language models to, to do this coordination problem. Because uh, firstly, I want the central planner to make both of them go to the right place. And this place must be different. Like the two blue squares must be separate. They cannot be the same blue squares. Okay, secondly, what I want them to do is I want the agents themselves to be able to navigate to the right position. Again, another challenge. So you can see now over here, six, nine, it's currently at uh, one, nine, and it's giving up, 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 up. Okay, that is because the fundamental bias, okay, somehow it tends to go upwards for this kind of square. So this is an example of a negative case whereby the agent is not able to solve the problem. Okay, but um, it's okay. We'll just uh, wait a while for like maybe 100 turns, it will restart again. I'm going to leave the agent here running while I talk about the code. Okay, so that we can like watch uh, the thing running while I'm talking about it. So this one is a gone case environment. Okay, <laughs> it's not going to solve this. Um, so. This problem might look easy okay, for humans, but it's actually very hard if you use large language models to solve it for reasons that I explained earlier, which is like, you kind of need the language model to understand what's up, what's down, what's left, what's right. Okay, I'm going to show you like the prompt over here. Are you able to look at this part here? Is it uh, big enough? Is, is it big enough? Okay, this for part? me, yep. Okay, so you can see that, oh, it solved this one. Hey, well done, all right. <laughs> so okay, maybe we, we just look at one more stage okay after this see how they can solve again so the beauty of using large language models is that it can solve it without like being explicitly explicitly told like blue squares i mean if i say non-red and green it works sometimes if i say that step on squares that are like adjacent to each other i, I mean if you make two squares adjacent then it is also able to work so it's quite free flow in the sense of what it can do Okay, so I'm just going to stop the thing here and I'm going to show you how this is coded. So this is demonstration one. Uh, this is the easier environment. Later, I'll be showing you the harder environment, but this is the first demonstration. 
Um, so what I did for this, so you can see that I'm actually using like the um, JSON framework to prompt. Okay, what I did was I, let me just restart the kernel first. Hey, no, no, I, I'll, yeah, I'll leave it here. What I did is I have a central planner. So this central planner has a certain few agents that you can control. So in the future, I intend to make this like uh, AI and human. So sometimes the agent can, that is controlled is only the AI agent. And then the human will do random moves or do that. you can do whatever you want. And the aim of this AI is to be versatile. And based on what the human does, you plan accordingly to do the stuff that the human doesn't do. So that's the aim. So it's like on interactable AI, which can like change its behavior based on what the other agents are doing, regardless or not whether you are being controlled. So it's like very adaptable team dynamics, whereby your agent is highly adaptive to the other agents. Yeah, okay, uh, this is not done yet. This is just like some envision or some vision that I have. So what is the metadata here? So the metadata I have is basically the data. Let me can I can afford to zoom in a bit. Okay, uh, are you able to see this better now? All right, can can I have some feedback to see whether like this is uh, visible right now? Okay, thanks. Sorry. So the metadata is very similar to what Richard did. Um, what I did here is I gave the coordinates here in the. This is the row. Sorry, this is the column, and then the other number is the row. So I start off with one indexing. So the first agent starts off at the top left. The second agent starts off at the bottom right. The squares will be generated randomly, the blues, green, and the red squares. Instruction here is free flow text up to you what instruction you want to give the large language model. Uh, if you give too complex, it will fail. Okay, but if you give it like sufficiently advanced, like you can give it uh, like more intermediate instruction, like do, do not step on the green or red squares. It can still work, all right? So these are the blue square positions randomly generated to make sure that they don't overlap. Like the blue, green, and red squares, there'll be two squares that do not overlap. Okay, the bot is randomly generated between size 5 and 20. Okay, here we have the biggest grid size. Okay, the world description is like, I give it, like the, the coordinates are given as column, comma, row. Okay, this is to do spill shop. Oh, sorry, this is do in-context prompting so that it kind of overrides the biases if possible. And over here, down means the positive row direction. Right is the positive column direction. So I explicitly say what they do so that the agents don't uh, mess up that badly. Okay, but as you see just now, it wanted to go down, but it, it's supposed to go down, but it went up for one case. So, you know, it doesn't solve this perfectly yet. Okay, so the two agents are to accomplish this task cooperatively. Okay, so what are the valid moves? So over here, this is actually, I was trying to experiment a bit with how to give it functions like, actions for the agents and uh, this will be sort of an extension to the strict json framework after i try it out enough times to make sure it works properly so i intend to do something like that you can give your function a name so it's like the open ai functions framework you give your functions a name when it is used for so i realized this use case all right which is something that richard didn't have i realized this is very useful for the gpt model to know what to do because this is like telling it when to use certain things like, for example, up is used when the row offset is negative. Now I give you an example. So if I didn't say this and I just said, like, the description is to move one step towards the negative row direction, sometimes it, it may not make the link, you see, that, okay, you only should do it when, like, the row offset is negative, then you try to move towards the um, negative row direction. So this is just to help ChatGPT perform a little better. Uh, I'm very sure if I use GPT-4, I don't have to do this use case thing here. Uh, but in general, it's good practice. For example, the functions you want to have could be like number calculation or could be like word completion. You can say the use case is for calculating numbers or the word completion is used for completing words. So you give the GPT some context as to when to use it. It can associate the prompt and the context and, and match the functions. So it's something like uh, the Asian framework in um, Langchain. Okay, they try to match the function to see whether the function is needed for a particular query. So th this idea of use case is there, right? So you can see that we have up, down, left, right. Okay, and then there's also one action called none, which is like, you do not do anything. So the central planner's goal is to output the goal for both agents based on the task at hand. And then I use the strict JSON framework to say that, okay, what I do is I get the thoughts for one action, uh, for, one uh, for both agents, then goal, destination, and goal, destination for both agents. So I plan the agent's goal. In this case, the goal coordinate. Okay, because the only thing the agent needs to do is to get to that coordinate. 
So the problem is split into two parts. Okay, the first part, let me just write here. The first part of the problem is planner, part one. Planner plans coordinates for both agents based on tasks. Okay, and part two, each agent comes up with a list of moves to reach goal. Okay, why do I do this part one, part two? All right? Why not just the planner plan all the, all the moves? Anyone want to guess why? Like, why did I split this into two steps? Like, why, why do I have a planner first, then the agent, based on the goal that the planner gives, plan out the moves? Why not just the planner give the entire set of moves to the agents? Yeah, anyone want to, like, guess why, why, why I didn't do I'll that? I'll have a... I think I know the answer. It's because if you ask for the outcome, like, the end of part two without asking for part one, it can't just make the associations through. It's the same thing as people are found in... You know, very early with chat GPT saying give me a step-by-step -step example of is much more effective than saying give me an example of it, the asking for uh, the intermediate steps to be done hierarchical planning yeah. asking for those intermediate steps makes the whole process much more effective mm, yes that's exactly right so it's actually um okay other than that there's also this element of a uh, hierarchical planning whereby if we go into two specific steps for the starting goal, okay, like take for example, walking from point A to point B, if I start planning my muscle movements, like left leg forward, right leg forward, left leg forward, right leg forward, it's going to be very, very lengthy, okay, and then you might miss the goal that you want to do. So like maybe the goal was to get from point A to point B, by the time your large language model output left, right, left, right, left, right, you might have forgotten what it wants to do already. So in some sense, planning the goal first is something like, telling it to plan sub-steps, sub-tasks. It's like auto-GPT or so. Like, ask it to plan sub-tasks for the agents to do. Then given this sub task as your goal, plan the list of movements that is needed. All right. Of course, you can also don't do the list of moves. You can also output the next move. But I did list of moves so that I can save my GPT inference cost. I can only um, ask the GPT once, and then I get like a series of 10 moves to go to the cell. So it's much more efficient that way. All right, so whenever the uh, yes, sorry. So I presume your central planner and your two agents they have you treat them separately as three individual agents, right? Yes, there's three different agents here. So I might I might correct to say that in the entire context of your planner. There is no description on the specific actions taken by agent. Uh, Namely, they, it only has the high level, you mentioned hierarchical planning, it only have the high level uh, uh, plan. They don't have the atomic actions done by each individual agent. Right, that is the ideal. Okay, but however, for this version one, I did not do that. For version two, you can see that. So right now, I also have the atomic actions right now. Um, but if I don't do That's atomic there. actions, what I will do is my move will then be something like go to X, Y. So this will be the yeah. macro level move. And uh, that's that, why I did that, that should the, be the Yeah, that should be how it's implemented. <laughs> Otherwise, they kind of defeat the purpose, right? Indeed, indeed. So um, that is exactly the case uh, that in my V2, I adapted this. I so right now, you and, can and see the more... central planner uses atomic actions, but in the future okay. update, it will not. Yeah. Uh, sorry, please one more ahead. comment. One more comment on the on the uh, coordination part, I I don't see uh the necessity of using a. I mean, I now I see that if you are done like ideally, then I understand the benefit of doing this hierarchical planning. But I don't I don't see why do you, other than that I don't see is there any other reason you want to use a central planner because you you are not trying to achieve some goal need to need the collab which need the collaborative effort of the of multiple agents, right? Because essentially they just go to their they do their own thing. They go to their own uh you you do need the collaboration because I have perfect algorithms to go to the nearest blue square and it sometimes fails because sometimes the nearest blue square is the same for both agents. So both agents step on the same square. So, so there is some need yeah. for communication so they don't they don't uh, yeah, so that they can do the, the task collaboratively. Um, I mean, the task is not an individual task. You need to see what the other I agent see. is stepping on. Then you step on the other one. I, I think. I so think in that's your sort environment. Of... Yeah. 
just one more clarification. So in your environment, is it physically possible for impossible for the two agents to be at the same coordinate at the same time? Uh, it is possible or it violate the rule. to be in the same coordinate. But it, but it violates the rule, right? Uh, no, no, no. It's, in this case, the environment allows for more than one agent at the same square. But that's not what you want, right? Uh, I mean, it depends on what you want for your environment. To me, I don't mind it because the thing is, even though they can be in the same square, all right, they may not solve the environment. Because you want both blue tile to be occupied. Yes. I see, I see. Okay. I, I mean, of course, you can make the yeah. environment such that you cannot intersect with one another for the agents. That is perfectly fine. Then uh, when that happens, it means that the agent needs to replan uh, using the other agent yeah. as an obstacle. Yeah, that, that, that will just mean that you need to use uh, better planning algorithms other than just like doing the offset and then like going up and down based on offset or left and yeah, right. And, and you need more interactions between the agent all through a central planner. So yes, then, and, uh, for, for, yeah, for that kind of setting, you really need, you have more reasons to do it in a centralized right. manner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think I think I was going to say the, I think as it is today, I'm not sure you need the centralized planner, but you do need two agents. Right? So you could have two peer agents that could communicate to achieve the outcome at the moment rather than having the planner. Because you know, as I mine as I point earlier, they're all running the same LLM. There's no fundamental difference between them. It's just the prompt they're given and the context they're given. Yeah. In fact, yeah. I can envision a two player interaction. Um, to decide the goal for each agent. So instead of a central planner, um, both agents can dis discuss among themselves and then uh, allocate goals for themselves based on discussion. Because as uh, what Richard said is correct, you don't have to have a top level person to direct them what to do. They can sort it out amongst themselves. Yeah. But in the future, if the environment becomes tougher and there's a need for hierarchical planning so that the top layers don't have so many actions, they have macro level actions, which are dissected into micro level actions at the bottom. Then I can see the role of the planner because the planner will have the higher level goal. And the planner is something like the coach in Richard's setting where the planner wants to achieve that goal and directs the people below it, like the agents below it, to achieve that. So I can see the use of hierarchical planning, but perhaps this environment itself uh, doesn't really need it. Are all good so far for this? Okay, so I will uh, sorry, just... one last one last question. Very short. So the entire grid world is fully observable for both agents. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but I can see that if you have the agents navigate to open up the environment, um, that is perfectly fine also. I think it is uh perfectly okay to still use this kind of setting. Just that you need to change the available squares. Like you need to have another um metadata called squares visible. Yeah, then perhaps in the like world description over here. Oh, sorry, the world description is up here. You can also say that you must like, you can only open up squares that are a distance one away from you. Then like, somewhere, um, like in order to accomplish the task, you need to open up sufficient squares to, to um, to open up the map sufficiently so that you can achieve it. You you need to like prompt it something like that. I can see it succeeding, even with uh, restricted visibility. Yeah, because after all, um, after you explore the map, it then becomes a problem of just going to the right squares. So it will be the same problem as this. Uh, do you do, do you um do you agree? Yeah. Okay. So this is the central planner, and um, using the strict JSON framework, you can see that, uh, it outputs some thoughts like agent one should move to blue square at here, agent two at blue square at here. So effectively, this deconflicts the two agents together. So this is exactly what we want. Uh, we have two different goals like that. Yeah, so these goals will then be fed to the agent itself. So now this is agent one, all right? This is a separate prompt, okay? So you just ignore this part here. This one is a separate prompt. This is agent one's prompt. Okay, agent one prompt is actually very similar to the central planner in this case. Uh, we are given the, the metadata like that, the same kind of metadata as the planner. Okay, and then we have in memory a goal, all right? And then what I want it to do is to output current position the goal position, the offset, okay, the thoughts of how to get there, and the list of next moves. Okay, so this is a very chain of thought prompting style. 
because if you don't do this chain of thought prompting, it sometimes, or actually not sometimes, it most of the time it doesn't work <laughs> because uh, it doesn't do navigation very well. LMs don't do navigation that well. So you can see this is what is a very hard coded kind of thing. Like you have a current position, you have your goal position, offset, okay, offset, simple number calculation, like two digit subtraction and addition is, is fine. Yeah, there's enough training data for that in GPT. And I mean, I also suspect they might have used a calculator API backend, but this works well for GPT, so it's okay. The thoughts, I need to move two steps to the right and one step down to reach the goal. So this is because in like the, in you, you will see earlier, down moves in positive row, right moves in positive column, and all these use cases here, you know, helps to prompt it to say that, okay, based on this offset here, okay, I can go two step right and one step down. Okay, of course it doesn't work all the time. You saw there was one agent that keeps going up. So it's not perfect, but you see, I have a list of moves here. And then what I do is for each time step, I, I, I pop out the first action from the list of moves and then execute it in the environment. So I keep doing that, pop out, execute, pop out, execute, and until the environment is soft. Okay, so once okay, the list of moves reaches zero, or basically we have no more moves, okay, what I will then do is I will ask the central planner okay, to plan again. So in, in this specific example, uh, what will happen is that, yeah, I mean, I, I realized I didn't code it properly, but what I intended to do is like, once these moves are out, ask the central planner again. So you can see in the second environment, I coded it uh, a bit better. So you can see that in the second environment. So like over here, we have the second agent, the same prompt is given. And then based on the current position, like 16.3 and the goal position is 18, sorry, 18.18 18 is the current position. Go is 16.3, we have the offset here. And then we can have the thoughts to get to this. I need to move two steps to the, to the left and 15 steps upwards. And then I get the next moves. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry, is this the correct, this the response, right? Yeah, so you can see that um, over here, uh, there's been some like error, you see? Like, I'm starting to give it two steps to the left and 15 steps upwards. And in the end, then these of next moves only have two. So stuff like this happens, okay, but it's fine because after a while, if this happens, I will, you see over here, the, once we move to 17, 17, okay, we have, a, like, we realize that we haven't reached the goal yet. Okay, so I, I do have a check. Okay, if the goal is not achieved, keep executing until you reach the goal. So in this agent, so you can see that although it failed the first time around, the second time around, it worked. So what does this mean? Okay, it means that uh, if we want to get very precise rules, Okay, LMs are not the way. <laughs> you, you can see that it's so much effort trying to get the large language model to do navigation when you could just jolly well just use an offset yourself like that, or you can use A star search and come up with the list of moves. So I've concluded that large language models don't do navigation very well. And uh, that's why like stuff like Voyager, like goes in the Minecraft, uh, they typically just use A star search. Yeah, so this is why, this is the reason why. I mean, after trying it out, I realized that large language models really cannot make it there. I think Richard, you have a similar conclusion. Like, uh, just, I, I yeah. think so. I've, I've, I've gone with a smaller, so because I've used the text-based thing and it's only doing one step at a time, my need for navigation is not very big. The idea is for mine that there'll be small move and then the opp opportunity to course correct. Understand. Now you can also um deem the navigation problem as a classification problem to classify the next move. Yep. And yeah, then then that case you just do. I, I mean, if you just do only one step, it's much easier. Yeah. In effect, that's what I've done actually. Yeah, it says I explicitly. Do, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, nice. I wanted to do more steps so that I can save inference costs. That's all. <laughs> but so, and I think you've done like for mine, you've done quite well. Mine was not, I haven't thought much about inference costs, I'll be honest. I've just kind of optimized it. There's a guy who makes Linux file systems and he says the, the path to hell is paved with, oh no, path to hell is paved with good intentions, but premature optimization is the root of all evil. Yeah. Okay. So this is more or less uh, why I did. I mean, the code itself, strict JSON, you can take a look at it um, in the other video I have on strict JSON. I do have other agents like the non agent does nothing, random agent makes a random move, and uh, this doesn't really solve the environment. In order to step on two blue squares precisely, it's very difficult. 
a nearest cell agent just takes a like direct path to the nearest cell and nearest cell co-ops agent takes a nearest cell to the nearest like blue cell that is not occupied. All right. So this is the one that can solve the environment rule base for the two blue squares environment, uh, but only the two blue squares environment. You change it to like one red and one green that kind of, you need to reprogram the code here. So this is the thing about um, precision and uh, finite tasks versus flexibility and uh, potentially infinite tasks. Okay, I mean, potentially, potentially because it's not infinite, okay? You need to program it within the set of distributions that is seen, right? So this thing here, this is what is known as programming. Okay, and this thing at the bottom here is what is known as LMs. So I think we need to combine both of them together. I am totally for doing both rule-based inside a system and the large language model in the system. Because large language models can help to do the um, association between arbitrary input output. Yeah. So this is something that is very, very powerful. And you can see that in this case, I don't even need to program the task in a programming way. I just need to say free text, go to near uh go to two blue cells, go to two blue squares, all will work. Yeah. So this is something that I mean, when you say step one, two similarly colored squares, it will work as well. Okay, I haven't tested it out, but I'm quite sure it will work. Okay, I mean, it may not be blue squares that is step two. It might step to green, step to red, but the central planner will be able to discern the meaning and, and plan accordingly. Okay, so this is the large language model agent, and I'm using the strict JSON framework to do it, and this is the output format, as what I described earlier. Okay, here we have memory. The memory will give the list of past transitions as well. You can see that over here, I appended the transitions. Okay, so again, if we run out of moves, okay, and if, okay, if the mem the goal is not reached, okay, we will ask the large language model again to plan the next list of moves. So this is the LM agent. Uh, for the planner, okay, the planner is basically like, um, for every ten turns I plan again. All right, <laughs> this is a very arbitrary cut off. All right, <laughs> so for every ten turns, if let's say I haven't solved the environment yet, I ask it to do the goals for both agents. Okay, so this is the environment itself. I'm not going to go through how it, how the environment works. Okay, but the idea is if you are interested to do this environment, um, what happens is that the AI will take actions at the beginning. Okay, and sorry, the planner will, will, will plan first and the AI will then, for each agent, take actions individually for this environment. Okay, I am going to go to the next environment because I do have another one that I want to show you. So I'm going to stop here, but if you have any questions, this is on GitHub, by the way, I'll post the link. But if you have any, any questions how to operate this environment, uh, do let me know. Uh, because I think like collaborative environments using LMs haven't really been explored and it's quite interesting actually. So this is a very, very simple environment. Now, what I want to do is, I hope to not crash my computer. So I'm going to run this two player grid wall environment. Okay, hopefully it won't crash. Okay, so fingers crossed, let's run this now. Hey, sorry, this is the same environment as just now, right? Yeah, I wanted to run the pick place environment. So let's run this and hope it doesn't crash. Okay, is it running? Oh, it's not crashing. Awesome, okay. So the pick place environment is an upgrade to the moving environment. Okay, because it involves picking up objects and placing them at arbitrary locations. So you can see this, this is the environment itself. So over here, I specified directly, move the red key to red square, blue key to blue square, green key to green square. Okay, earlier on, I tried to say like each key just move to the respective squares. Okay, but um, that <laughs> sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work. So you can see that right now you can have an inventory at the bottom here. I, I'm not sure if you can... Uh, can you see the, the game, by the way? Can you see the game? A thumbs up or something if you can see the game. You can see that I have an inventory here. So there's two more objects, two other than the actions, up, down, left, right. Okay, I do have another action called pick up object. So you need to specify what object you're going to pick up and place object. So you can only pick up objects that are on the same cell as you are. And you can only place the object if it's currently in your inventory. So you can see that this has solved the environment. So the red key to red square and so on. So you, you see over here, up there, we can see the goals over here. Like the goal that is given to agent two is move blue key to blue square. And then the 
agent one is moved red key to red square, which is done already. You can see it's all done. So now after both agents have satisfied their goal, I'll ask the central planner to replan again. Okay, and in this case, I make it very, very explicit to the central planner, okay, that you can only give one very, very specific goal to each agent, like ask it to move an object to somewhere or move itself to somewhere. Because I don't want a very, very lengthy goal. And um, if you have too lengthy a goal, too many steps, it confuses ChatGPT. So we want the agent to only have very specific goals. And over here, you can see it's blue and red is done, but we need to get the agent to figure out that it needs to, you know, place the green square, uh, green key. Okay, so let's see whether the central planner can do it. So right now it's replanning. The central planner is replanning. So unfortunately, it's doing red, blue, red, blue. Sometimes it, it might just miss out this part. So let's see whether it works. Okay, so this is, by the way, quite difficult for the large language model to do because it needs to do three different subtasks, like this one, this one, and this one. So the problem that I face for this environment is that it's not too sure which is completed and which is not completed for this subtask. So I, I had to do some prompting to try to get it to work. Okay, but as you can see, it's not perfect. Okay, I think this is a great demonstration here because I don't want to just show a complete working product and you don't learn anything. Okay, I'm going to show you like this is the version that I have right now. It will be improved. But as of now, this is what you see. Like, um, it's not able to go to this last subtask. So, but in the earlier case, you saw that it was able to. So let's let this continue running and let's dive in to, to see like what exactly I did for this prompting. So I'm not going to go through the code too much. I'm just going to go through the um the JSON uh output. Are you all able to see this system prompt here? All able to see this? Yep. Okay, so um the system prompt is exactly the same as just now. Okay. It's just that now in the world description, I added a few more stuff. Like do not invent your own moves because you know when I have pick and place, they have other stuff like transfer agent which are plausible actions, but you know we don't want them to like hallucinate their movements in this. So like, do not invent your own moves. I guess I could say you must not invent your own moves. Okay, so these are stuff that um is just done to make sure that as much as possible, the LM agents don't hallucinate. Okay, but this is not a safeguard, all right? So note that all, not all available moves are useful to solve the task. There are three objects, red key, blue key, green key, and three types of green, uh, squares, red, blue, and green. Each agent has a separate inventory, and the agent must have an object inventory to place it. Note that you cannot pick up the squares. Okay, there's this very weird trend that like it gave, like it thought that the object was a square, which I guess is a valid assumption. Uh, so I had to give this over here. Like, um, do not pick up squares. Okay, and also like stepping on the square equates to being on the square itself. So I mean, I did not really understand what does stepping mean. So I need to say all this. So you can see that uh, semantics does matter quite a bit. So the task is move these keys to various squares. Uh, we have the agent one and agent two. Now, instead of just position, I also have inventory. Okay, so as the game gets more complex, in the inventory, we will also have the items and their specific actions, like key can be unlocked. All right, then um, arrow can be shoot. You know, there, there's different actions for different uh, items. So that will be the next step of this game. All right, and then like you can shoot enemies and so on. The enemies will be moving. So I can imagine this to be very complex. And the idea is to make it as complex as possible, but still solvable with a system of LMs. Okay, so I, I hope I excited you all here. I'm trying to create a 2D Minecraft actually. Yeah. Because Minecraft is proprietary, you know. I want to create something that we could experiment on, um, but not pay much money. All right. <laughs> so over here we have the objects, not inventory. It's like the uh stuff that can be found in the game world. And then we have like the, where are the blue squares, red squares and so on. Over here, these are the valid moves. You realize that in order to give very, very explicit moves, like go to X, Y, I did this angle brackets here. I realized that this causes the large language model to fill in the blank with whatever they like best. All right. So this is like how I did arbitrary function calls. So I quite like this approach. Used to navigate to this destination cell X, Y. Okay. And then you can see like we have pick up object also in angle brackets, which means that I can replace this with any arbitrary object. Use case used to pick up this arbitrary object. All right, then the constraint is you must be in same size object to perform this move. All right. 
quick question. How many of you think the large language model always obeys this constraint? Okay, raise your hand if you think that the large language model will always obey the constraint. Okay, raise your hand if you think that the large language model doesn't obey the constraint all the time. Absolutely no chance. Yeah, yes. no chance. So this is this is uh, where the large language model is the downside of the large language model is uh, you probably need to have a rule-based checker in the function itself to make sure that they don't violate the constraint because it violates and it violates quite frequently. And in fact, um, in like Voyager, if you violate the constraint, you can even give it feedback from the function saying that, oh, there's no object to pick up. Then you can replan again. So that's like what Richard was suggesting, the function feedback. I haven't implemented this yet, um, but this will definitely improve performance because the environment can feedback to the um to to, to, to the planner and you are able to use the feedback as con context to plan better. So you realize something, right? I gave the, the stuff in this pickup object, okay? Um, go to certain squares. I gave all this as meta level actions. And the idea of this meta level actions is that like the agent can then plan later, like how, how to do it. So like over here, okay, I realized that, um, yeah, Maybe these are not meta level enough. Like go to X, Y is meta level, but pick up object is a bit too mac micro. Uh, what I should have done here is maybe like in the list of action, I can say move object to X, Y. Uh, maybe this will be a more macro uh, view. Then the agent can then use this to dissect and plan accordingly. Okay, so this is not mac micro enough. Maybe that's why it didn't work all the time. Yeah, because all this pick up and place, okay, we actually don't need the central planner to know, right? We just need the central planner to tell the agent, okay, you want to move this. Then at the lower level, you do the planning there, all right? This is what I mean by hierarchical planning. So the macro level action should be as broad as possible, as generic as possible. And then when it goes down to the agent, the agent will plan at their level itself. Have, so have you quite... found some sort of intuition about where that starts to break down? Let's, okay. So there's a trade-off between the number of, of activities possible and the complexity of the activities. So here you've gone from place object and pick up object, but there's only one argument to so move object to XY. So there's three um, parameters to that one function, but there's only one function instead of two. So have, do you have any idea of where that trade-off might live? I think you can just try until it breaks down that you try to reduce <laughs> <Okay>. complexity. <laughs> because uh, honestly, uh, it depends on the problem. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So I, I do like this idea of angle brackets. And you realize that all my functions here are just like this. Instead of Voyager, Voyager asks the Voyager asks the LM to generate full Python code. Okay, this is actually bad. All right. This, this, this is very bad. All right. Because LMs don't generate code perfectly. All right. Um, goes in the Minecraft, they ask it to do like um function and parameters as separate calls. Okay, I realized that actually that is a, a bit too complicated. Something like this is the in-between. You can just ask it to output a function as text, including the parameters as text, but separated by space. So you can pass the parameters later. So I realized this approach works best. Okay, I tried all kinds of approaches. This is what works best for me, and this saves a lot of token counts. So I think in my strict JSON framework, when I'm going to implement functions, uh, the functions will look like this. They will be all text-based. Okay, and the, even the, fun the parameters will be text-based so that the LMs can generate this much better. Okay, it's way better to just give like pick up object here as the name directly and say name is what, param is what, like name is like pick up and then like maybe param is object. You know, if you do something like that, sometimes it may not associate the parameters to be here. You know, mm -hmm. it, it needs an additional step to associate that. But if you do both all in the same name here, it does the association perfectly. So, Pat, we, we touched on typing earlier. I was saying I needed a Boolean. He said, I've got a solution for that. How do you address typing of the outcome? So where I want a Boolean true instead of the string true. Okay. So um, what you need to do is if you are already very sure, okay, that the outcome will be a true or a false, Okay, what you will do is that you will just take the result of the straight JSON output. Let's say we call this a Boolean value. Okay, then you do, you proceed to just uh, pass it such that all the text becomes Boolean. I mean, this is one way. 
to do it. Uh, the other way is to just ask it to output Boolean. So it's like when you specify your output, I guess, like in your, okay, maybe, let me just go to the part where the output is. Okay, um, okay, so if you go to the part where the output is like that, okay, you can you can basically output it as like boolean is like true or false. You, you can just specify this in the in the function description and, and like ninety nine percent of the time we will output the boolean. Okay, right. Yeah. So uh, that's one way to do it. And then if you want to very be very, very sure that it's a boolean, you can do your post-processing yourself. So I'm very sure the OpenAI functions did something like that as well. They did post-processing from the function output. So uh, what we're doing is just implementing this by hand, which saves a lot of tokens. And, and honestly, the LM works most of the time. So you don't have to worry too much about this. Okay, so let's move on to like what the planner does. So you can see that there's quite a lot of things different here. So I asked it to output the goals for the task. So I want it to split the task into subtasks here. So it's like auto GPT, split the subtasks. So like, for example, move flower to carrot, crocodile to fish. So I, the goal will be move flower to uh, at one, two to carrot at three, four. Oh, I realized I forgot to change this part here. So maybe, th maybe that's why the agent is not doing so well. <laughs> so at agent two to blue squares at five, five, and three three. So maybe maybe that's why it's not working so well. I forgot to change the task when I changed the goals. So I want it to split the original task into sub goals. Okay. And then each sub goal has a very, very specific completion condition here. Like if you want to move the agent at three three, your agent must be here. Agent must be here. And this one must be here. So I think one way of um getting the um uh, movements for the central planner right is I can ask it to move object to position. So this case, the object can also be move agent to position. So you can have everything as one function for the central planner. So I think I will work on doing that over the week. Yeah, so I realized that I could have done that. So over here, what I did, I did chain of thought prompting the prompt for completion condition. I prompt for current position of objects like flower, flower at what, agent at what, agent at what. Then after that, I can have the uncompleted goals being printed out like that. So then based on this chain of thought prompting, Okay, these uncompleted goals can then be assigned to the agents. Like, for example, I gave it like some examples that you can do, like move object, move agent, or do nothing. So these are the goals that you can output. Okay, but I realized that, you know, you can just use this condition, move object to position. You can, all, all the goals can be of this form. Yeah, so uh, this will more or less like generalize everything that I'm trying to do for this environment. Okay, so yeah, you can see that I had to do a bit of a chain of thought prompting for this because I realized sometimes it does not solve the green key. Okay, it doesn't solve the green key that well because it can do the red and blue. Okay, but when it comes to green, it doesn't realize the red and blue are completed. It, it keeps trying to complete the red and green, red and blue tasks. So over here, you can see, like, I think it didn't, did it solve this? Stage three. Okay, it's still stuck at this red and blue here. Okay, I think Right now, you can see that um, this doesn't really work out too well. Let me just interrupt this kernel because I want to um, not burn my um, GPD money. <laughs> so you can see that this is uh, still work in progress for this environment. It's not easy to solve this. But yeah, I think something like this, chain of thought prompting like this. Okay, although you lose the generalizability of different environments, but at least for this environment itself, by guiding it through as to what it should look out for, you actually help it to, to generate better output. But then the question is, should we just rule base the completion? Should we use a rule base approach for completion criteria? Because I realize sometimes the GPT agent may not give the right answer, all right? Because it's still ultimately an association. So I think the answer might be incorporate some rule base for certain things that require precision, like whether the goal is completed. Okay, I mean, uh, yes. I think yeah. I was going to say that was one of the one of the sort of hard decisions I made in the way I put it together was the simulator is not the thing that's the LLM. Right, the sim game simulator is the game, and so 
that made things a bit easier in that regard. So I'm doing Python, straight up Python programming, nothing to do with LLMs in there. But, and that's the role of the LLM is to unpick that game, to play the oh, game. Same thing here. It's just that yeah. um, this is the LLM's perspective. Like okay. Whether to, what to focus on, it needs to know whether the goal is completed. So the game won't tell you whether the sub goal is completed. The game will only tell you whether the main goal is completed. Oh, I see. And if all conditions are completed, well done. Otherwise, you're on your own. Correct. So like for your okay. example, the chicken dinner one, you only have one condition. Like here, I have three different conditions you need to fulfill. So that's why I want it to do some subtask planning. If not, it may be too difficult to like just plan the whole, whole main task at one go. Yeah, so this is the modification for this environment. Obviously, it's not perfect yet. And I mean, if you have any questions, I can invite you all to say now. Um, but you can see that this is the agent planning. The agent planning is also, uh, I realized I use the same functions as well. But after talking to Zeri, I realized that, you know, the main planner should have a different set of functions. Okay, and the, the agents more micro and the main planner should have something more macro. Okay, if not, if not, it might confuse both sets of uh, planners. So this is something that I discovered after today. Thanks so much. Yeah, so the, the simulation will be much better right now after I implement this. Okay, and uh, the for the agent, agent itself, it's the same thing. It's outputting a list of moves. And in this case, because it's a bit not so straightforward, I actually gave it some examples. I had to move this flower to gray square. Then I gave it a list of moves to do that. Yeah, then go to over here. Over here, you see the go to. It's not actually up, down, left, right yet, right? So this one, one way is to have another LM planner at the lower level to do the up, down, left, right. But over here, I just do it rules based. Yeah, I, I just use the rules function to decompose your original point to the end point and plan accordingly. And you can even use A star for that because uh, LMs are not good <laughs> at, at navigation. Yeah, <laughs> so... This is one thing that I realized that a combination of rules and LMs are probably the way to go. It's probably the way to go. Uh, so you can see that um, once I have the plan called like go to something, right? You you will see that like over here, current position is one, one. Okay, I have my inventory is nothing. Go is oh, over here. The goal did not get passed down. Okay, so something wrong with this. Yeah, um, you can see that the prompting here failed. All right, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So but if there's a goal over here, the goal will be used to condition the agent's actions. Uh, but right now you can see that because there's no goal, so it just made its own thought itself. Like move the red key to red square, blue key to blue square, green key to green square. And then the first move is go to 2-2 two, two and pick up red key. So go to 2-2 two, two because it's at 1-1. One, one. I After I use the rule base thing, I get right and down. So I, I decompose like the plan rule into plan movement into something more specific at a lower level. Yeah. So you can see things start to get a bit more complex here. Uh, this is something that it's not really done in Voyager. Like Voyager, they use like compositionality of the skill library. You have more and more skill libraries or more complex tasks. Right now, what I'm saying is that we should have different levels of actions at different hierarchies and then plan at the right level. So condition on the top level planner, you split your things into subtasks and then even sub subtasks at the bottom. And overall, what you execute is what you execute at the bottom here is the sub subtasks. Yeah, so I think I will conclude my sharing here. Obviously, the environment is not perfect yet. You can see that it's uh, it's great for maybe red and blue keys, but it still hasn't really figured out how to solve the green keys yet. So yeah, I will probably end the sharing here. Uh, any questions so far that you all have for this? So I realized for hierarchical planning, right, the lower level action it's better to be done in a deterministic level because I think my intuition is uh, lower level action, they are they can be handled by rule-based method pretty efficiently. But the difficult part comes in where you want to come up with a grand goal. Like, then at a point, it's hard to do it deterministic because the classical planning requires you to, to, to pass the message from the low, lowest level to highest level, then that incur a lot of computational costs. So I think the way to go forward is lower level mechanistic or deterministic, higher level heuristic. Uh, and the heuristic, the heuristic comes from 
the the knowledge or reasoning or common sense or whatever from uh, and it, it basically is how how the Voyager does it. But I think the this structure is pretty efficient. Yeah. Mm, yes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and also there's also this thing of iterative feedback. So like the functions or the environment should feedback your agent itself. Uh, that's not implemented right now over here. But once that's implemented, you will get more performant agents. And sorry, the feedback from uh from the environment, functions. like let's say you pick up the key and it failed. I never really feedback this to the agents yet. So the agents wouldn't know that the action failed. I see. Uh, feedback to the central agent or the individual? Both, both no feedback because I haven't implemented okay. it yet. Okay. Yeah, but you can see that this uh solves it. Like even if I don't do by subtask breakdown, sometimes it solves it using the like pots and go one, go two. Sometimes it managed to do it, uh, but most times it fails. So the big place environment is quite difficult for this regard. Yeah. Okay, uh, any other things? If not, I will end. And yeah, I think this one, I'll continue to work on this because whatever things that we get out of this thing here will be used in LMs as a system. Uh, it can be used to solve this kind of grid world environments, real world collaborative problems, something like auto GPT, but better. Because auto GPT, is, uh, it doesn't really have these fixed layers of abstractions. Like how to get these abstractions here, I think it's something that, that can be thought about. But for now, let's, Assume that it's fixed, all right? Because Auto GPT tries to do everything generally, so it's a bit more vague. But I think the way to solve like this kind of environments is that you need to have some specifier or <laughs> some some agent that makes it more specific, so that you get more specific output. And you cannot just use LMs only. I think you have to use both a mixture of LMs and rule based stuff to solve this kind of system based problems. So yeah, these are my main takeaways. Last um few minutes, uh, any other things you want to ask about or share based on your experiences? Okay, if not, thanks for coming and I'll see you all next week. Okay, bye-bye.